page we see a uh, distal ureteric structure and on the last image we see multifocal dilatation and uh, structures of the biliary tree based on these um, images i would like to sorry i would like to take your um, uh, polling for what is the most likely diagnosis So I'm sharing the results. Most of uh, the um, participants chose uh, IgG for uh, related disease, followed by amyloidosis, which represent about 21% of the participants. The patient underwent upper GI endoscopy which, with the duodenal biopsy, which showed the um, xenophilic material, which uh, stained positive for congruid stain, which is consistent with amyloid. So briefly, I'm going to discuss uh, amyloidosis. This is a heterogeneous disease. Some uh, even consider it as a constellation of diseases. It can affect any organ system. Amyloidosis has a uh, male predilection. It also mostly affects middle-aged individuals. It can present in almost any way because it affects uh, uh, almost every uh, system. Uh, it has been uh, subclassified into primary amyloidosis when it is a, a monoclonal plasma cell dyscrasias. Secondary amyloidosis is usually related to a chronic inflammatory process, which includes a tuberculosis, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple myeloma, or any other form of chronic inflammatory disease. There is also a hereditary amyloidosis, which has a strong association with familial Mediterranean fever. We have senile amyloidosis. We have also a localized form of amyloidosis, which affects a single system. And there is also dialysis-related amyloidosis. I'm going to concentrate mostly on gastrointestinal amyloidosis because uh, this was the clue with our patient. The most striking features were in the gastrointestinal system. So uh, in the GI, it mostly affects the duodenum, followed by the stomach, where it appears uh, similar to linitis plastica. Uh, next, it can affect the colon and rectum as well as the esophagus. The features in the gastrointestinal system include uh, diffuse wall thickening, intersusception. It can also cause um, hypomotility. It can also cause GI bleeding. And also it can cause luminal narrowing due to either infiltration or related to ischemia. Differential diagnosis for this appearance on, uh, of GI gastrointestinal involvement includes infectious enteritis, bowel ischemia, other infiltrative processes like lymphoma or any other cause of gastrointestinal bleeding. In regards to other system involvement, most of these are case reports. As you can see here, the, there has been some cases reported which involves the uh, CBD causing viral obstruction and cholangitis, as well as uh, ureteric involvement, as, uh, as is the situation with our patient. So I'm going to move to case number two. We have selected the CT scan and MRI images. OK, so I'm going to launch a differential diagnosis uh, poll. Okay, so most of the participants chose leiomyosarcoma, representing about 
followed by leiomyoma and ovarian fibroma. So this lesion was uh, resected and uh, histopathology revealed uh, cotyledinoid dissecting leiomyoma. So I'm gonna speak briefly about uh, cotyledinoid dissecting leiomyoma. It is also named Sternberg tumor. It is a variant of uterine leiomyoma, which is rarely diagnosed by clinical evaluation. It has a distinctive appearance, which is grape-like appearance with multiple exophytic masses. It is often misdiagnosed as either ovarian tumor or uterine sarcoma. It usually arises in the subserosal myometrium and extends along the lateral borders involving the broad ligament and pelvic cavity. The most important feature in the dissecting leiomyoma is that it is non-invasive. Uh, usually it appears similar to the muscle signal intensity in both T1, T2, and post-contrast enhancement indicating muscular origin. This is the surgical specimen which reveals the distinctive grape-like appearance. Differential diagnosis for such an appearance include leiomyoma, intravenous leiomyomatosis, as well as leiomyosarcoma and endometrial stromal tumors. I'm going to show some examples of the differential diagnosis. Leiomyosarcoma, as we can see in this image, shows more heterogeneous signal intensity and it is classically invasive. Intravenous leiomyomatosis, which uh, is a variant of leiomyoma which extends intravascularly and can go all the way up to the IVC and causes either bland or a tumor thrombus. Last differential, uh, which is endometrial stromal tumor. As you can see here, there is a large mass, most likely arising from the endometrium, dissecting through the my myometrium into the pelvic side walls. As you can see here, the signal intensity is uh, very distinctive and it is uh, intermediately bright rather than the, uh, uh, the uh, dissecting leiomyoma signal, which is more or less similar to the adjacent muscles. Okay, so this is our third case. We have selected CT scan and MRI images. Okay, so from these images, I'm gonna launch a differential diagnosis. Okay, so most of the participants chose IPMB followed by biliary cyst adenocarcinoma. So this uh, lesion was resected and showed intradictal papillary neoplasm of the bile duct with high-grade intraepithelial neoplasia. So we'll talk briefly about intradictal papillary neoplasm of the bile ducts, I, or IPMB. It's a pre-invasive biliary tree neoplasm, which is considered a precursor of cholangiocarcinoma. It is more frequent in Asian. Uh, other risk factors uh, include primary sclerosing cholangitis, biliary tree malformation, cholidocal cyst, or familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome. It usually manifests as biliary tree dilatation, either focal or diffuse. The biliary dilatation can be attributed either to viscous mucine secretion or mass effect from the solid component within the dilated ducts. It also shows a characteristic cauliflower-like papillary tumor with 
up and downstream biliary dilatation. The management for this lesion is surgical resection. However, it carries a better prognosis than classical cholangiocarcinoma. The recurrence rate is estimated from 20 to 60 percent, depending on the presence of invasive components. Differential diagnosis for such an appearance includes hepatolithiasis, recurrent pyogenic cholangitis, or mucinous cystic neoplasm. This is my fourth case. We have selected MRI images. Okay, so most of you chose dermatofibrosarcoma followed by spiradenoma. This lesion was resected and the histopathology confirmed uh, ecrine spiradenoma. So we'll talk briefly about ecrine spiradenoma. It is a uh, rare benign dermal tumor of the sweat gland. It shows a lobulating mass in the deep portion of the dermis and superficial subcutaneous fat. It is not connected to the, uh, the, the epidermis. It has a uh, predilection for developing in the upper thorax. It's usually well-defined. However, it carries a uh, malignant potential. Uh, management is usually by surgical resection. This is the appearance of a similar case on ultrasound. It shows uh, the dermis uh, origin, and it shows um, fairly lobulated, well-defined, uh, hypochoic appearance with internal vascularity. Differential diagnosis for such an appearance includes dermatofibrosarcoma. Uh, it usually involves the skin and subcutaneous adipose tissue, and it shows homogeneous enhancement. So the distinctive feature in our case, which is a spiroadenoma, is lack of continuity with the epidermis, as well as the heterogeneous minimal septal enhancement. Okay, so this is my fifth and final case. It shows, as you can see in the far right side of the image, a CT scan performed in October 2019, followed after about one year with MRI. Okay, so based on these images, what is your most likely diagnosis? So most of you chose uh, paraovarian fibromatosis, 76% of the participants, followed by Brenner tumor. So this, uh, these lesions uh, became bilateral ovarian fibromatosis. So we'll speak briefly about it. 
it's a uh, rare benign phenomena where there is a tumor like ovarian enlargement. It is not a neoplastic process. It usually affects younger premenopausal uh, patients with mean age of presentation of about 25 years. It has strong association with sclerosing peritonitis as well as omental fibrosis. On MRI, they carry characteristic appearance with low T1 and T2 signal intensity and a special sign called Black Garland sign. Uh, in dynamic post uh, contrast enhancement, it shows the typical expected features of a fibrous lesion with slow progressive enhancement and retention of contrast. This is the garland appearance, which is a form of decoration, which is quite similar to the uh, MRI appearance of these lesions. Differential diagnosis for such an appearance includes ovarian fibroma, ovarian thicoma, or fibrothicoma, as well as Brenner tumor or Krakenberg tumor. However, in paraovarian fibromatosis, usually the ovarian tissue is spared, and the whole process is paraovarian in nature. Thank you, everyone. Uh, these are all my cases. I would like to give a special thank to Dr. Badram Dairi for his assistance, for his guidance. I would like also to thank Dr. Khaled Al-Mana and Dr. Abdurrahman Al-Zahrani for provi providing me with these cases. I would like also to thank my colleague, Dr. Samah, for her help during preparing this presentation. And thank you to all the fellows for their support and guidance. And thank you so much for everyone.